The Nintendo Wii U was Nintendo's successor to the Wii. While the Wii had the Wii mode, a controller with motion controls, something that's pretty easy to understand and has quite the novelty, the Wii U had this, the GamePad. The GamePad is a giant controller with a touch screen, and I actually mostly like it. It's surprisingly comfortable to hold and overall a pretty neat idea. Using both a TV screen and a separate touch screen for games opened the door for a lot of cool gameplay ideas. But the problem is not a lot of games really use this thing, so it makes me question why did they make this big expensive controller the identity of their console if they were barely going to use it. There's also the fact it's not entirely clear what this thing actually is. Nintendo put such a heavy focus on this that a lot of people either thought this was its own handheld, or it was an add-on to the Wii, which it's neither. While the Wii mode is so easy to understand, you can just watch someone shaking and get the idea of what it is. For this and many other reasons, the Nintendo Wii U is the worst-selling Nintendo console. It had some pretty awful marketing, too. Whoa-shi! It's a double Yoshi explosion. So much for Amiibo to do? My head is spinning! Your whole body's spinning! Go Digby! That didn't stop me from getting a ton of games for the system and having a really good time. In prior console generations, I liked video games, but not nearly to the same extent I do now. Uh, then I started watching YouTube and I realized how many different kind of games out there I'm missing out on. And, uh, the Wii U was basically the beginning of this, and because of this, entering a whole new console generation, especially that of my favorite, my personal favorite game company, it was an incredibly exciting time for me. I was expecting a lot to say the least. Despite what you may think, I wasn't disappointed. Though I do think it's for less than legitimate reasons, which I'll get into way later in this video. Before I start this video, I should say this is about my personal history with the Wii U, not the history as a whole. So because of that, I'm missing, uh, I'm going to be missing some key titles in this, like uh, Pikmin 3 or Hyrule Warriors. That's not to say I'm not interested in playing those games, I just haven't gotten around to it. I'm also not covering every game I've ever played on the system. Uh, I'll be covering every physical game, but there's a lot of digital games I played and will not talk about in this video because this... This video is already going to be long enough as it is. And lastly, I'm going to be giving a lot of games mini reviews in this video. That doesn't mean I'm not going to give them full reviews at some point. There are some games I'm covering in this video like Sonic Lost World or Mario 3D World that I'll definitely give full videos someday. Anyway, video time. I'm going to be organizing these games by what years I got them in and not when they came out. And I was late to the party on a lot of these games because I was a broke high schooler who relied solely on allowances, birthdays, and Christmases. I'm also going off my memory, so I may be off a year or two on some of these, so don't expect 100% accuracy. The first game I got was New Super Mario Bros. U. Definitely a fun time with fun and well thought out level design, but like many have said before me, not the most creative game out there. It's still really confusing to me why Nintendo put so little creativity into this series that made them into the household name when they have put so much more thought in everything else, but with the release of Odyssey, I'm hoping that's going to change at the next game. Oh, and it had DLC, New Super Luigi U. Yeah, 2013 was dubbed the Year of Luigi, so Luigi got a lot more love in this year than usual. But it was also Nintendo's worst year financially ever. All because of Luigi. It can't be a coincidence. Luigi U is an alright game. I like the higher difficulty, that was welcome, but I detested the short time limits. It discourages exploration, which is one of the biggest reasons why I enjoy 2D Mario so much, so that alone really soured my experience. Other than that, I really don't have much to say about either of these games. It's new Super Mario Bros. What can I say? Nintendo Land was a pack-in title to anyone who got the deluxe set. It was basically the Wii U's Wii Sports, a minigame collection full of games meant to show off the capabilities of the Wii U gamepad. Each one of them was based off an existing Nintendo property with this really cool theme park plasticky aesthetic. I don't know how else to describe it. Luigi's Ghost Mansion was probably the best use of the gamepad in the entire console. The person with the gamepad is a ghost and no one can see where they are because the only screen that shows a ghost would be the gamepad screen. Takamaro's Ninja Castle is the opposite end of the spectrum of games that were enhanced by the gamepad. I thought it could have been good, but they had to ruin it by forcing the player to hold the controller in a really awkward way. I wish I could have just used a Wiimote for this, that'd be nice. Mario Chase and Animal Crossing Sweet Day were both good times with friends, though it is a little basic, but I still had a ton of fun with these. There are even some decent single player stuff like Pikmin Adventure and Donkey Kong's Crash Course. Octopus Dance sucks. 
Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed was, for the longest time, one of my favorite kart racers out there, thanks to its excellent controls, fun single-player mode, and some of the best and most inventive track design I've ever seen. This game allows you to transform from a car to a boat to even a plane, and it allows for some of the coolest track design I've ever seen. Tracks constantly break down throughout each lap, making each lap feel very different from the last. Of course, it even has some excellent fan service, plenty of Sonic characters and stages, of course. There was a ton of other Sega representation too, Golden Axe, Knights, Space Channel 5, Crazy Taxi, Super Monkey Ball, and a ton more got a lot of characters and stages. You can play as a Dreamcast via Mew. And Danica Patrick, my favorite Sega character. Even Ralph from Wreck of Ralph in the PC version has Team Fortress 2 characters in Yogg's Cast? Yeah, Yogg's Cast, that one YouTube channel. But notice how I said Transformed was, for the longest time, one of my favorite kart racers. Well, I've been playing the game again on PC with friends and it made me realize a few things. There's a lot of small things I really don't like about this game. The ice item is way too common, the AI seems to have some pretty deadly accuracy, and if you happen to screw up or get unlucky enough, it's next to impossible to catch up thanks to the lack of strong items. Like, I'm not necessarily asking for a blue shell equivalent, but something more powerful than Sky Tigers. There also seems to be some collision issues online, like I bump into a wall or another racer and how far I bounce away seems to be really random and sometimes way too intense. Still a good game, but it could have been a lot better if it was just polished off a bit more. I still recommend the game if it sounds interesting to you. Just avoid the Wii U version as it has some major slowdown at certain points. <laughs> Scribbledots Unlimited was a fun time just to mess around with, thanks to its creation tools, you can make anything you want. Oh yeah, I got this game when I was 14. It shoots whales?! It even has Nintendo characters, and any game that allows you to hang Luigi is at least a little good. Finally, typically the reason I get any Nintendo system, 3D Mario. I was a little disappointed they went for a much simpler 3D Mario game on the 3DS. I love exploring giant worlds and games, and I was disappointed I wouldn't be doing that on the 3DS. I eventually became pretty okay with this more linear gameplay style because I guess I wouldn't want an experience like that in a handheld anyway, and I was sure we'll see the next 3D Mario game I want on the next Nintendo console. Right? Nope. Okay, but seriously, despite it not being exactly what I want, I can't deny 3D World's quality. It has some of the best level design I've ever seen in a platformer. So many different levels introduce all these crazy new ideas, and it makes every single level in the game feel fresh compared to the last. There's a level where a flagpole just sprouts wings and flies away. I love stuff like that. The multiplayer is also pretty great. Getting one friend to join you on a playthrough is probably the most fun you could have with a video game. But I really do just mean one friend. Any more than that gets a bit too chaotic. This is one game that absolutely needs a Switch port. Come on, we have Mario Maker 2's 3D World style. A game that runs on the same engine. And Cat Mario and Mario Kart 8 Deluxe all on the Nintendo Switch, but not the actual Mario 3D World. Sonic Lost World is a pretty divisive game among Sonic fans, and for a good reason. It has some pretty odd decisions like giving Sonic a run button and an overall slower game than what even Sonic Colors offers. It has some occasionally uninteresting level design, awkward controls, and Super Sonic has two mouths. I still like it. I'm not going to deny it has a lot of problems, it definitely does, and it's not at all a game I recommend if you want to get into the Sonic series, but... I still like it. It still has a lot of decent platforming and overall a lot of things I love about Sonic, and I didn't find the game nearly as frustrating as other people. Even getting all the red rings and unlocking Super Sonic wasn't too bad for me. It also had the coolest free DLC ever in the form of Yoshi's Island, which is really Yoshi's story stage, and even the Zelda stage. You can blow up the Gossip Stone with a bomb list! I don't even care what you think about this game, you have to admit that's awesome! Speaking of Zelda... The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker HD is an excellent remaster and I legitimately haven't returned to the original since I got the HD version, at least for reasons outside of messing around with action replay. It obviously has nicer graphics, but the real star of the show is the swift sail. It makes you sail twice the speed and that alone makes this version the definitive version. 
This remaster absolutely needs to come to this Switch. A remaster of this could should not be stuck on a console like this. Mario Kart 8 is the best Mario Kart. Thanks to its anti-gravity, Mario Kart 8 has some of the coolest tracks I've seen in a kart racer. Not as cool as Transform, but about as cool as you can get without distraction. The ways they've redone retro tracks is seriously incredible. Cheese Land and Ribbon Road aren't even recognizable. They even made N64 Rainbow Road good by adding the possibility of falling off the track. My only complaint is Battle Mode kinda sucks, but they fixed on the Switch version, so... I guess at that point, aside from the lackluster roster, my only other complaint is I'm not a fan of how automated 8 is compared to a lot of other kart racers and even some of the earlier Mario Karts. But even then, that's more of a preference than an actual issue. Oh, and I don't like how there's no adventure mode or any kind of single player in this game. Ever since Diddy Kong Racing and Crash Team Racing, it's been a standard that every kart racer besides Mario Kart has some kind of single player mode. Heck, even Team Sonic Racing. With the exception of DS, this just does not apply to Mario Kart, and that makes me sad. Hopefully they change that the next game. I actually have an interesting story revolving around this game. Uh, back when I was in high school, there was this YouTube channel I watched a lot of uh, called Hellfire Commentaries, and they did this thing every Monday called Mario Kart Mondays, where they set up a tournament and play with fans. It's a pretty cool thing. The problem is, they're from Europe, and they're... Uh, there, I think 6 p.m. was actually my, like, I don't know, 9 a.m. when I was at school. So, being an American, I was kind of screwed out of that, except for one snow day where one snow day happened to fall on a Monday, and I was able to join a tournament, and I even appeared in the same room as the uh, main guy there, Anton64. And this happened. We'll ignore that. Okay. I'm sorry, Brandon, but you're in front of me, so you're gonna have to die. Sorry, your plot has holes in it. Super Smash Bros. for Wii U was the reason why a lot of people got a Wii U. And why wouldn't they? Smash Bros. is always a guaranteed fun time. A giant crossover with not just Nintendo characters, but video game characters as a whole? This one added a lot of pretty wild characters like Pac-Man, Mega Man, Wii Fit Trainer, and with some DLC, Cloud from Final Fantasy VII, and Ryu from Street Fighter. Oh, and a couple more Fire Emblem characters because the fans demanded it, dang it! <laughs> Should I have done that? Unfortunately, thanks to the release of Ultimate, there is no reason to play this one anymore. Every other Smash game has some kind of reason to return to. This one, not really. Smash 4 just didn't have much side content. The ability to draw stupid pictures over a screenshot is the only thing I really miss. Still a fantastic game at the time, and I have so many amazing memories playing this one with friends for hours. Smash Tour sucked. I'm going to be going into a little more depth than this one because I don't plan on covering this game in a full video at any point because of the impending sequel, and that's also the only game I got this year. Super Mario Maker was the only major Wii U title I got this year. Judging off my Amazon history, it's likely because I was focusing on rebuilding my PS1 and GameCube collections that year, but oh my god, Mario Maker alone justified my Wii U purchase. I've been watching a Mario game where you create and share your own levels for forever, and I was absolutely ecstatic when it finally came. When I got the game, I made a ton of levels, some I'm proud of, some not so much. Some of my personal favorites are Arcade Accolades, a medley of some of the most well-known arcade games, Babom Factory, which I mostly just liked because I thought I did a good job making the stage look nice, and I liked the puzzle at the end. Same goes for Ride the Parabuzzy Boo. I also think that stage looks nice, and I don't care how egotistical I sound when I say this, but that is an amazing name. I also made a recreation of Green Hill Zone Act 1 from Sonic 1 because I felt like it just wasn't in enough games already. I made a few other Sonic stages like uh, Bridge Zone from Sonic 1 in the Game Gear and City Escape from Sonic Adventure 2. Talk about low budget flights, no food or movies, I'm out of here, I like running better. Oh, that's another thing I adore about this game, the amiibo costumes. 
Thankfully, you don't need Amiibo to unlock these costumes. Amiibo really only serve as a shortcut. The Amiibo costumes a lot for some amazing crossovers. Every character from Super Smash Bros. 4 was playable in this game, which meant you can play as Sonic in a Mario game. That's absolutely insane. So I can actually be Sonic in my Green Hill Zone recreation. Not sure why he rolls around instead of running, but that's still pretty cool. The costumes weren't even limited to Amiibo. You can play a lot of different characters, including Mario from the manga. That's something I didn't expect to see in any game. It's not even the weirdest one. You can play as Hello Kitty in this game. What's up with all these Hello Kitty crossovers? I'm spending a lot more time talking about these costumes than I probably should because I really, really love them that much. Even if they don't really add anything much gameplay-wise, but, like, the novelty of being able to play as Sonic in a Mario game cannot be understated. Either way, I am absolutely heartbroken they're not coming back in the sequel. And I'm actually more upset about that than the lack of option to play with friends online because I have questionable priorities. Come on, I need to play as Sean the Sheep in my Mario game! The actual execution of, you know, absolutely everything else was also excellent. That's a weird way of pronouncing also Elsa. You can choose between four styles, Super Mario Bros. 1, 3, U, and the objectively best one, Super Mario World. They even have reimagined enemies, songs, and level types that weren't in the original game, so things like Wigglers in Mario 1 and 3, or Airships in 1 and World. I freaking love the Airship theme in Mario World. It's a remixed version of that game's castle theme, which is probably exactly how they'd handle it. Shockingly, the Mario 1 airship theme is even better, and I think it might actually be better than the normal one you'd hear in games like Mario 3 and even Galaxy. They even use a little bit of it in Mario Odyssey's opening cutscene, so I guess Nintendo likes it too. Oh, and kind of like Mario Kart 8, this game allowed me to interact with a YouTuber, this time Nintendo Capri Sun. I've been watching him for years at this point, and I was absolutely ecstatic that he actually played a couple of my levels after I submitted them to him. And he did a very good job stroking my ego. This comes to us from Brendan Blair. It's an awesome name. And then this is Bowser's giant tub. Oh my god. Are you kidding me? I was wondering how they were gonna do this. Just let him take his bath. And then at the end, we get the- Oh, it's a shine! Oh my god! <laughs> That's awesome! Oh, whoa, whoa, this is- Dude, this is actually really good! <laughs> oh my god, that is so creative! Man, you're good. You're good at designing levels, I must say. This is, this is some cool stuff. But seriously, that stuff made me smile from ear to ear, and I'm pretty sure he's the sole reason why I got over 900 stars. What, am I not allowed to brag a little bit? This year was mostly about catching up on games missed out on. I can't imagine why. Sonic Boom Rise of the Lyric was one of those games I initially missed out on. Then I bought it from Amazon New for $11. That's a good sign. It was a tie-in game to the cartoon of the same name, and believe it or not, that cartoon is actually pretty great. Yeah, let's uh, feed it a chili dog. Everyone loves chili dogs. I don't think he can eat solid food. Well, then put it in the blender. Well, if you say so. The chili dog, not the baby! Oh, okay, that makes more sense. Jesus, he didn't even hesitate. Amazing cartoon aside, this game gets a lot of hate. A lot of people cite it as one of the worst Sonic games, or even worst games of all time, and uh... No? I've played far worse both within this series and outside, and I honestly don't see the hate. Maybe it's because I've played other games of the platform beam up genre that are far worse, but this game doesn't scream bad to me. Okay, yeah, it does in a lot of areas, but not really as a whole. It definitely should have had more time in the oven, and the hub world sucked, but everything else to me is at least competently done. Some of the platforming is actually pretty solid, Sonic jumps like a dolphin in auto-run sections, and in no way is that not amazing, and I even like some of the theming. This coral reef in an area with Moses-like parted waters is especially cool. Don't get me wrong, it's still not a good game, and it's still absolutely inexcusable that Sega release a game in this state. And seeing the earlier Sonic Synergy gameplay makes me sad, knowing what could have been if it wasn't forced on a console that's incompatible with the engine. I'm just saying, I don't hate this one. Maybe my opinion would change if I played it again. It's been a while and I've noticed it become a bit more cynical towards certain games, but as of now, eh. No matter what you think of this game, you have to give it credit for inventing the Drop Dash, a move Sonic Mania so cruelly stole credit for. Yoshi's Woolly World was a game that I really wanted to play, 
but didn't have the money. I love the original Yoshi's Island, I like Kirby's Epic Yarn, so it seemed like my kind of game. I didn't like it. I honestly couldn't tell you why, it's been a while, but it just didn't click with me. Which seems weird, everything about this game seems like something I like. The music, the art style, and how insanely creative it is. Sonic Yoshi! You can play as Sonic Yoshi! That is the best thing I've seen in anything ever! But yeah, it didn't click with me. It's been a few years, so maybe my opinion would change if I gave it another chance. Though at this point, I'd rather wait until a Switch port because I vastly prefer playing on that console. Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze is one of the greatest 2D platformers out there. The level design in this game is insane. Climbing up an active avalanche, riding on a rhino through several tornadoes, or riding a minecart through a sawmill while avoiding tons of giant saws and chunks of wood to then jump off the minecart and land on a log, and that same log later turns into another minecart because of the sawmill. Those are just a few examples of some of the crazier moments in this game. This game is also really hard, like if you play this you're gonna be dying a lot. Some of the bonus levels forced me to be in this zen-like state before I was able to beat it, and I love it. The music in this game is also pretty amazing. Homecoming Hijinx is one of my favorite songs out there. Seriously, get this if you haven't already. It's also available on the Switch and it has an easy mode called Funky Mode. So if the high difficulty was a sticking point, there you go. Never mind, the Switch version sucks because it doesn't have that angelic Donkey Kong chant. Minecraft was something I managed to avoid. Again, not because I wasn't interested, but because I played on Nintendo consoles and it took a while for Nintendo to finally get a version of Minecraft. I mean, I did have an Xbox 360 at this point, but I was too busy buying games like Sonic 06 because that's where my priorities lie, apparently. I've been mentioning Sonic a lot in this video. I was really only interested in this game because I like the idea of being able to make whatever I want. The whole survival part was never something that interested me personally. Once I did get it, I actually remade a decent amount of Bikini Bottom. There's no official layout so I just made it up as I went. I never finished it, barely did anything in Jellyfish Fields, and I don't even think I started Kelp Forest or Downtown Bikini Bottom. But I still got pretty far and I made sure to put in as many references as, as I could. But I never could figure out how to write Sandy's Tree Dome of Cows and Pigs. The Wii U version even had exclusive Mario content like a bunch of skins, one with Mario with Flood, and I love that. And even a pretty gigantic map with references to many, many Mario games. Probably my favorite being this full 3D remake of Dinosaur Land from Super Mario World. So unfortunately around this time was when three of my Wii U games were stolen from my own home. I'm not going to get into too much detail, but yeah, that sucked. And uh, those games were New Super Mario Bros. U, Super Mario 3D World, and The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. Obviously I've since rebought the games, but it really, really sucks to have things stolen from you. Also, I ended up getting the plus New Super Luigi U version, so now I just have two copies of New Super Luigi U because I have a physical version right there. Uh, and this counts as a different game. Um, so I don't have my original 100% save file anymore because the Wii U counts as a different game and that sucks, but hey, I have it. And it's not even all the games were stolen. Uh, I also got Phantom Hourglass and Mario Advance 2, which were both stolen, and I still haven't rebought them to this day, just haven't gotten around to it. Thieves suck! If you haven't seen my last video, I love Paper Mario, and I got into the series around this time, and I was aware of Color Splash. Yeah, like many, I wasn't particularly happy with the direction the series was taking, so I didn't really care about Color Splash. I still got it for Christmas because my god look at Nintendo's Wii U lineup this year. I admittedly didn't hate Sicker Star as a repetitive game thanks to its lackluster combat, but I'm more willing to forgive a repetitive game if it's on a handheld since it's so easy to just play for like an hour every few days or so. Console games take a lot more dedication, so I was hoping they'd fix the combat. They didn't. Sticker Star's problem was that it was too simple. Color Splash's problem is that it's too simple, and it takes like 5 steps just to perform one attack, so I'd argue Color Splash's combat is worse. This is a game I want to like, its art style much like Willy World is insanely pretty and creative, the writing is actually fantastic, the music's fantastic too, Marmalade Valley is one of my favorite songs from the entire Paper Mario series, and there's a song that's sung by a shy guy, that's so good, but I just can't like this game. Despite my not so strong distaste for this game, I would love to see a Switch port, since I can treat it more like Sticker Star and just play in short bursts, and putting this on the Switch would force them to streamline the combat by mapping it to a normal controller, so it wouldn't take forever to kill anything.
This was post-Switch announcement, meaning everyone including Nintendo stopped caring. Nintendo even ended the Wii U production before their last Wii U game, Breath of the Wild, came out. However, I still felt the need to get one last Wii U game. Splatoon. I know this may come off as a very questionable purchase considering the far superior sequel was announced at this point, but I'm weird and I feel like I need to play games in order, so the announcement of the sequel was a kick I needed to actually get it. I took so long because I just don't really like online games in general. I can have a good time playing with friends online, but not so much with random people. Either way, Splatoon is still a good game. Your goal, unlike most online shooters, isn't to get a bunch of kills or to battle royale or whatever but to ink more turf than the opposing team, and it's a good time. Splatoon 2 is better in just about every way, so you should probably play that instead, unless you have strange priorities like me. Also, people still apparently play this game online because that's how I was able to get footage, and wow, why play, play this sequel? Yes, I did indeed get a Wii U game in 2018. My friend Jacob sent me Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival for Christmas. We don't talk anymore. I'm kidding, he also gave me eShop gift cards, so I guess that makes up for it, almost. I can't actually play this game because I don't actually have any Animal Crossing Amiibo, so all I can do is admire the title screen, and what a mighty fine title screen it is, I guess. Either way, I somehow doubt I'm missing out on much. I mean, call it a hunch. I loved the virtual console on the Wii. It allowed me to finally try these once elusive classic games, and I even found some of my favorite games ever through the service. The Legend of Zelda, Majora's Mask, Paper Mario, and especially Sonic 3 and Knuckles are all some of my absolute favorites. And I have the Wii's virtual console service to thank for showing me all these titles. I'm nowhere near as fond of the Wii U's virtual console. Nintendo really dread fed us games, NES was the only thing for a while, it took way too long to get Super Nintendo, and N64 didn't even come until like halfway through the Wii U's life. Well, for the Wii, every console was represented from the start, the moment the service launched. I did appreciate how there was now save states and button mapping, but the game lineup took way too long to get anywhere. And NES and N64 have a really dark filter over them for some reason, and that alone makes me vastly prefer the Wii's Virtual Console. There was also mostly only Nintendo consoles, while the Wii had consoles like the Sega Genesis, Master System, TurboGrafx-16, even the Commodore 64. The Wii U didn't get any non-Nintendo consoles until the very end with the TurboGrafx-16. However, I would be lying if I said the Virtual Console didn't have some really great moments. Not at all an RPG fan, but seeing Earthbound finally get an affordable release in the US, and Mother 1 coming at all, is, was actually pretty great. GBA and even DS Virtual Console became a thing, and that's actually really awesome. I can finally live my lifelong dream of having two copies of Super Mario World on the same exact system. Thank you, Nintendo. But seriously, that was great and very much appreciated. They even gave us the e-reader levels in Super Mario Advance 4, and those have been inaccessible for a long time thanks to Nintendo never releasing the proper cards here in the US. GBA Virtual Console was just done really, really well. The game output was still crap, but the games looked really nice and they gave you a lot of really nice graphic options. They even allowed you to look at scans of the manual, and I feel like that should just be a standard now. Playing DS games on the TV was also pretty surreal. And I was happy it was an option, if, even if I only ever got Mario 64 DS. Indie games are the one thing that thrived on the Wii U. Well, thrived in quotes. I never really played too many indie games before the Wii U, not because I wasn't interested, but because I played mostly on Nintendo consoles and there weren't too many indie games on Nintendo consoles before the Wii U. At least none I was interested in. The Wii U is when indie games I was interested in started rolling in. Little Inferno was one of the earlier games I bought, and it was alright. You get to live your dream of committing arson and no one will bat an eye. Yeah, you burn things in this game and not much else. It's a fun game and it's impressive how far they're able to take such a ridiculously simple concept. I just don't think it should be any more than 5 bucks. I got Freedom Planet the day it came out on the Wii U because being a Sonic fan, I was pretty interested in trying it out, especially after watching Some Call Me Johnny's review. After playing it, I absolutely loved it, but it, I didn't get too much Sonic out of it. Okay, I did, but not to the extent you think I would. 
Aside from loops or wall running sections, this game isn't nearly as fast. Heck, you can't even run at top speed unless you do the dragon dash or the level design allows for it. This isn't me complaining, I'm just making a point that this game isn't nearly as fast as Sonic for reasons I already mentioned, and the fact combat is actually a thing, and believe it or not, I think it's a lot of fun. Unlike certain other Sonic games. This game seriously has the best bosses I've seen in a 2D platformer, and it's so satisfying. I especially love what they do when you beat a boss. The game slows down, a heavy emphasis on explosions, usually the boss yells out something in anger, and it feels so good! Admittedly, this story is kind of bland, and the cutscenes can be as long as 15 minutes sometimes. But that's what classic mode is for. You get no cutscenes at all if you play this mode, and it's just level to level. So, no matter how dumb the story can be at times, at worst, the story is inoffensive because of this. This is a really, really great game, and I highly recommend it if you haven't played it already. It's also available on PC, PS4, and Switch, and I'm not just recommending it because it features a purple dragon, I tend to like games like that. I just really, really love it. And it was even my favorite indie game for the longest time until a certain cute as heck platformer came along. I remember I was constantly pestering my friends to get free and play it back in high school, and who knew, harassment works because most of my friends eventually got it. With the exception of this stupid idiot. Cubelay Violent Survival is a crappy Minecraft clone, and I got it because Minecraft wasn't on the Wii U at the time. Despite it not being very good, I still spent a decent amount of time with it, at least enough to remake about half of Delfino Plaza. I stopped halfway through because actual Minecraft was coming to the Wii U and even had exclusive Mario content which can contain Delfino Plaza, which I had mixed feelings about to say the least. Oh, and I for some reason decided to make The Simpsons home within the same map? I don't, I don't, or, I don't know why. As a side note, I remember a Miiverse post where someone was very much convinced that the game was going to take over Minecraft. Moving on. The Letter is one of the only horror games I've played, and it's not the best introduction game. This is apparently one of the lowest rated games out there, and for a pretty good reason. It's a very boring game, all you do is wander through dark environments looking for stuff. There's no monster stalking you or any other form of danger. The creator seems pretty cool though. He made another game called The Gem Collector and I posted this to Miiverse and he seemed to like it. Good taste. Octo Dead is an interesting experience, but not $15 interesting. It's a game where you play as an octopus masquerading as a human father. This game has a lot of fun with this one dumb concept. I especially like the part where the chef tries to kill Octo Dad for some fresh meat for his pot. The game has you controlling each individual limb, and that's pretty much where all the challenge comes from, so it's basically a much goofier quap. I overall like this game, but $15 for a game that's like an hour and a half? I'd say pick this up when it's on sale, it's on pretty much everything now. Finally, we have Angry Video Game Nerd Adventures. I've been a fan of ABGN since I started watching YouTube. I love his stuff and I was happy to see he was getting an actual video game. It was even coming to the Wii U, didn't expect that. As a game, it's a solid 8-bit inspired 2D platformer that takes a lot of inspiration from games like Mega Man and Castlevania. This probably sounds pretty familiar because it sounds like 50% of all indie games out there. What separates this from those games is the AVG and IP. This game has so many references, you're absolutely going to be smiling a ton if you're a fan of the web show. There's even a level based on those Atari classics that I don't feel comfortable with showing in this video. It's a solid game, but unless you love the angry video game nerd, there isn't really any reason to try it out, thanks to how common the genre is now. If you are interested, I would say maybe wait until the upcoming remastered version, that one's coming to the Switch. I don't really know what it entails to be honest, but hey, it looks interesting. These aren't all the indie games I've played on the Wii U, but I feel they're the most notable. There are other titles like Freeze Me that I still want to talk about, but I already made the video long enough, so I'm going to end it here. So that was the Wii U, a console I really loved at the time. However, looking back, the library really wasn't that great. What was there would tend to be really good with uh, some strong exceptions, but the problem there is there just wasn't much there, and I didn't notice at the time, but I think the reason I didn't notice it is because I was a broke teenager who relied on allowances, Christmases, and birthdays. Uh, um, my brother became very generous with his money because he had an actual full-time job around, I think, 2016. Um, and I very much appreciate the games he got for me, but he is kind of the reason why I realized how bare bones the Wii U library was. And, yeah. That, though, to be clear, I still loved the Wii U at the time, and I still do, because I have a lot of great memories with it. Though, it's really not a console I'd recommend getting. Uh, mostly because a lot of the great games that were on the Wii U later were ported to the Switch. 
And I even uh, played, I was even able to play some of the games that I initially missed out on thanks to that. And they're just generally better versions. As a console, you're more likely to own, and of course, the Switch's portability is fantastic. Though I will say it does definitely devalue the system. Because all these ports are happening, and they're probably going to continue to happen until every worthwhile Wii U game is now on the Switch, it, there isn't really a reason to pick out the console. I mean, as of now, I'm already kind of afraid to get any Wii U game because any game I want that I don't have yet, like Pikmin 3, I know are just going to get Switch ports, so why would I get them? And this also does make me understand why a lot of people feel a little ripped off because, you know, this far superior console is getting every worthwhile game on the previous one. Though, at the same time, I don't really agree with that just because, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to play the games as soon as I did if I waited that long, and I wouldn't have the memories I do now, and, yeah, like, I keep on saying I had a lot of amazing memories of the thing. So, yeah, no, overall, I really wouldn't recommend getting a Wii U. Just get a Switch and get the ports there. It, it has better exclusives as a handheld. The console itself is way better, and the Wii U ports on that, on that system are generally better. So yeah, just, just get a Switch. It's really good. I love the Switch, and I'm really happy Nintendo is able to turn things around this generation. Uh, their games are a lot better, they're doing better financially, the console itself is way better, and I guess you can expect another video like this whenever the Switch is out the door. That's not going to happen for a long time, and honestly, I don't know if I'm still going to be doing this by then, but if I am, then I guess expect a video like this. As for my next video, uh... Honestly, even as filming this, I have no idea. Maybe I'll do a crash marathon, I'm kind of leading to that. But even then, I'm not 100% sure of a few things holding me back from doing that. Um, maybe I'll do something else, I don't know. Either way, I'll see you with whatever next video I have planned. Bye.